Our topic today addresses the question, when is influence undue? We're going to be looking primarily at will contests and mental competence, primarily at challenging the dubious will. But clearly, what we talk about today has broader implications for the whole field of testamentary capacity contracts and the like. For those of us who labor in the sometimes stony fields of the state law, the scenario is all too familiar. An elderly gentleman gets a new caretaker or a new housekeeper or a new best friend. We'll call her the beneficiary to be, the BTB. And the BTB sweeps into this gentleman's life does the housekeeping, does the cooking, does the errands, and takes the gentleman, drives him to his doctor's appointments. He's long since been unable to drive. She uh, pays the bills, opens the mail, screens the phone calls. One day, she brings the elderly gentleman to her attorney, wherein a new will is drafted excluding his two children, Lila and Adam, in her favor. A few weeks later, she drives him back to the attorney, and while she waits discreetly outside the attorney's office, the attorney reads to the elderly gentleman the new will that they have just drafted. And after each paragraph, the attorney asks if you understand, and he says, certainly I do, and you, you know that uh, you have a, a nice house and a fair amount of Procter & Gamble stock from the 40 years you worked for the company, yes. And that now these are going to Ms. Smith rather than to Lila and Adam, yes. But inevitably, when after about a year, the, the elderly gentleman dies and Lila and Adam get wind of what has happened, almost certainly that will will be challenged on grounds that the testator was not competent. Important fact he might very well have been competent. He may very well have been competent because the test of competence in most jurisdictions is very low because the state has an interest in protecting your right to do what you want with your estate, including squander it. You can even try and take it with you. As long as you know that this is a will and you know what a will is, that who the ordinary beneficiaries might be uh, a rough sense of the size of your estate, that house and the PG, PG stock, uh, you're probably competent. Too bad for your kids, or whoever. You're probably competent even if the three, the three Ds are in evidence. And the first D is debility. By the time you're 90 years old, you've got a lot of chronic ailments, chances are you're quite debilitated, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't know what a will is, and that you're changing your will, that you're moving the beneficiaries from here to there, and again, roughly what you're worth. The second D, dementia. We'll be talking at greater length about that, but it refers to chronic organic brain disease. The commonest form of Alzheimer's, people with many strokes will have dementia. But again, so long as that dementia does not substantially contaminate, again, your knowledge that this is the will, uh, that I'm changing the beneficiaries, that my estate is worth roughly so and so, you're probably competent. The third D is delusion. Uh, you can have a fixed irrational belief that is clearly uh, on a paranoid basis. You can um, believe that the neighborhood is now infested with communist spies. You can believe that uh, the earth is flat. You can believe that the Bush administration has actually made the Middle East safe for democracy. It doesn't matter how far out your delusional system, so long as it doesn't directly affect those elements that I indicated earlier. Uh, the, the, your, the, the size of your bounty, your natural heirs, and the fact that this is a will transaction. Undue influence, on the other hand, is a much more subtle process. 
let's give you a definition, and we'll go back to it, uh, compare it with competence in a minute. But uh, in most jurisdictions, undue influence is defined as a situation in which a person's will is overpowered and they are induced to perform an act that they would likely reject were they free, uh, were they able to act more freely. Undue influence is that which destroys the freedom of will in favor of the will of another. So, pretty good definition, I think. It's much more complicated than incompetence. And there is another distinction in that unlike competence versus incompetence, which refers to the condition of a particular individual, undue influence is a dynamic process between two or more individuals. Air is great complexity. Let us now look at those clinical conditions which can render someone susceptible to undue influence. And clearly, these conditions can certainly, if severe enough, render a person mentally incompetent as well. But I think those cases are fairly obvious and are really not our focus today. The first clinical condition are what we call degenerative diseases. Now, by, we're not raising any moral flags when I use the word degenerative here, but rather deterioration of cerebral cells so that the individual loses cognitive powers, executive functions, and judgment. Uh, we mentioned, uh, in other words, dementia because of, say, an Alzheimer's condition or many strokes or a head injury. Uh, so that we see individuals who will perhaps enter, uh, make foolish arrangements that they would have quickly rejected 10 years before. Uh, these degenerative processes can call, cause individuals to become quite isolate, to isolate themselves from loved ones, perhaps exclude them from their wills for petty reasons. But I think you can already sense how difficult this can be to assess because certain character traits that we now discern are a product of this dementia, of this degenerative disease, may simply be an exaggeration of traits this individual has exhibited all their lives. I'm thinking, for example, of uh, this elderly uh, law professor, last name Marshall, who was married to the late uh, Anna Nicole Smith, and apparently left her millions. And of course, his family uh, is still litigating that uh, post-mortem. Um, he was senile, they say. That's why he did this. And maybe he was. But if you look at this man's life, in his, in his middle age, when he certainly had all of his marbles, he regularly went to strip joints and was regularly very generous uh, to the ladies that he would take up with. So um, was he senile? Was this simply a bit of more of an exaggeration for the end of his life of what he did when he was clearly entirely competent. So the symptoms of dementia or degenerative processes are highly variable and they can merge almost imperceptibly with changes all of us undergo in the process of aging. Not so my second group of conditions, psychosis. And people who are psychotic will harbor delusions. They will hold bizarre beliefs that are refractory to reason. Uh, they may not see and hear the same things the rest of us do. They have hallucinations, typically auditory hallucinations. These are people that the average individual would say, God, this guy's clearly not, not, not in his right mind. These are the folks that inhabit mental hospitals, for example. But here, even here, Psychosis may not be an all or none phenomenon. Uh, there are many schizophrenics, for example, who can go out on pass from the state hospital and go down to the 7-Eleven and buy an 89-cent Coke and expect 11 cents in change. Uh, they can do this even if they think they have a special relationship to Napoleon. Um, so that... Again, the question is, does their schizophrenia 
directly affect the elements that go to making a competent will. It may, it may not. A schizophrenic, like anyone else, can make mistakes. They can make the mistake of choosing a wealthy spouse over a loving one. Or in purchasing a used car, opt for a flashy but exhausted Jaguar convertible over a tireless Toyota sedan. That this schizophrenic may also enjoy receiving marital and automotive advice from the Oracle of Neptune would be of little help in court when finally doubting the wisdom of his choices, he seeks to annul his marriage or turn the automobile back to the dealer. He's out of luck. I think there's an old wonderful common law phrase where a man cannot uh, dispense with uh, a wife or a horse he acquired while delusional or drunk uh, if he continued to mount them while sober. So I think this, this may apply to some extent here. Uh, I was involved in a lot of the uh, post-mortem litigation around the estate of Howard Hughes, and I will tell you that this man was Looney Tunes. Um, he never cut his nails. He, he sat in a darkened room all day watching old movies. Uh, the room had to be cleaned with Kleenexes, no, nothing else. He would only eat canned peaches, and the canned peaches had to be handled very carefully so that the peaches were not bruised on the inside of the can. So this man clearly was psychotic, and yet, in, in my estimation, when it came to making business decisions, he was a Kirk Corian. He, he, that part of his brain continued to function. He had a lucid island in this sea of insanity. Uh, many psychotics walk the streets. You'd never know they were psychotic. I know one or two who practice law. So, again, we're dealing with a variable process. Uh, there was a recent case, uh, Supreme Court Oregon case, where the Adult Protective Services wanted to sweep in and take over the, the life, of both the estate and the person of a woman who regularly galloped down Main Street on a horse while stark naked. Now, I think to most of us, uh, this would be a sign of insanity. And, and she claimed that God told her this is the best way to be in direct touch with nature and the spirits. And um, the Adult Protective Services were not surprisingly alarmed by this conduct, because she did it in winter as well. But the Supreme Court ruled that they had no say in the matter, that uh, she did not constitute any harm to herself or others. And, she had an idiosyncratic explanation for what she did, but that was her right. And um, so they left her in charge of her own person, her own estate. And I see this increasingly, where uh, individuals that make my hair stand on end and, and make me want to rush in and protect them, uh, the courts will say, back off. And so I will see some patients and clients uh, meet disaster the civil rights intact. And so it is that you have a civil right to, to squander your money. Again, uh, however, I think you can see where someone with a delusional system uh, might or might not be unduly susceptible to undue influence. Uh, we mentioned briefly in my common law example intoxication. Obviously, if you prepare a will while drunk, Unless you subsequently ratify it during sobriety, it probably is not valid. And certainly alcoholics tend to be unduly susceptible to undue influence. Mental retardation is another factor. Many mentally re retarded people exhibit a child's suggestibility and gullibility combined with adult access to funds and thus can be ripe targets for those who would exercise undue influence. <clears throat> Let us now look at the elements that constitute undue influence, or elements which both attorneys and psychiatric experts like myself seek out in order to make a determination that influence was undue. But before I talk about those, 
a word or two about ordinary garden variety influence, influence which is not undue, the normal condition or baseline where the influence or undue influence is presumed to be absent. Um, arguably, there can be no undue influence, irrespective of the BTB's dark motives, if the testator or decedent to be, at that time, knew his or her own mind. Hands off. What's mine is mine. I earned it. I can spend it the way I want. If they have that kind of attitude. It doesn't matter how much influence is, is being sent in their direction. Uh, it's going to bounce off of them, ergo not be undue. If the testator can readily distinguish his interests from those of the BTB, the, ben the beneficiary to be. If they can distinguish a neutral, disinterested request, like past assault, from one that is deliberately persuasive. There's a difference between saying, may I borrow a little money versus, you know, I could really fix up your house really nice if only you'd loan me some money. The first is sort of a, you know, a neutral request. The other got some hooks in it, some persuasive hooks. So the first thing I guess we have to do is, is establish in our own minds what ordinary healthy or benign influence is. Uh, during the last 20 years of my mother's life, I regularly provided her f firm financial guidance. I, I certainly influenced her regarding her medical care, uh, her ever more supportive living arrangements. Uh, there was nothing undue in, in my influence of my mother, although being her son, uh, without a doubt, I, I influenced her greatly. So powerful influence does not mean that influence is legally undue. Well, what does? There are 10 indices which, certainly taken together, I think, compel a finding that this influence was undue. First, undue influence tends to be invisible. That is, the person who's being influenced is unaware that they're being influenced. Most advertising that is effective is effective because we're not aware of the fact that someone's trying to persuade us to buy something. It's just a handsome man or a pretty woman in the ad and, and then the name of the product. Now, advertisers know putting those two together tends to put their product in a favorable light. Um, if you see all the wires and the pulleys, it tends to be ineffective. Uh, a good attorney in his closing argument will say, now I am not here to tell you how to decide this case. When in point of fact, he or she spent the last three weeks doing precisely that. But you don't want people to know that you're twisting their arm. They will resist. If they don't know their arm is being twisted, uh, perhaps they won't. Um, I think uh, Mark Antony you know, said, I, I'm not here to praise Caesar, but to bury him. Of course, he was there not only to praise Caesar, but to bury those who killed him. But if he had showed his hand right off the bat, uh, they would have booted him out of the Senate. So he kept what he was about to do hidden. So that's, I think, the first and perhaps the most important element of undue influence. The testator or the decedent to be is unaware that it's taking place. Number two, the testator is debilitated. Uh, maybe the three Ds, maybe some other things, some diabetes, some heart disease, fatigue, uh, anemia. Uh, they're not eating well, their weight has dropped, they're depressed. There are a lot of reasons why people can be debilitated and just their ordinary access to resisting any influence is mitigated by their debility. Closely lied to that would be medications. There are certain medications which may be keeping the testator alive but have debilitating side effects. So you really want to get all the medical records, see what they're taking, and look not only at the purpose of the drug, but are there some side effects that are not apparent and not in the records? Um, obvious drugs like tranquilizers can, can reduce will, but surprisingly, drugs given for heart disease and blood pressure can also pr pr profoundly affect one's mental state. And there are a host of others. We don't really have time to go into them, um, but the, the list is available. Uh, the fourth is where the testator is isolated 
from their usual supportive and corrective experiences. If they spend most of their time in their house, their primary contact with the outside world is with the BTB, uh, they are clearly are at a disadvantage because they've lost their past groundings. The thing that suffers uh, most as one becomes aged and debilitated is memory. And here, the only memories that they, that they have that are fresh are the, all the good things that the BTB is doing for them. And 70 years of good relationship with their kids or with their friends fades and is replaced by these more proximate memories. Uh, and this, I think, is a, is, a con is a consequence of being isolated from all those cues, those landmarks of one's previous life, landmarks which were honored in the previous will. The fifth is that the testator is dependent upon the BTB. It's the testator does the cooking and opens the mail, pays the bills, does the driving and all the other errands, and brings him his fifth of scotch every other day. Uh, so this person begins to loom large in their hearts. And again, past services of other more worthy people fade from memory. Six is when the beneficiary has a powerful persona. Uh, there are alpha male and females and beta male and females. And if somebody, by dint of education, wealth, personality structure, intelligence, articulation, uh, or sheer malevolence, uh, can have a persona that overwhelms uh, the testator. Seven, one should be suspicious if the provisions of this new will appear in some fashion unnatural. Uh, all of a sudden, a man who's never set foot inside a church leaves everything he owns to the church down the street or maybe his housekeeper's church and cuts out his kids. Uh, or this one niece visits on a regular basis and the kids are now across the country so they don't get to see dad very much and all of a sudden the niece gets everything and the kids are cut out. Now, we have to distinguish between something which is unfair versus that which is unnatural. Sometimes when these cases go to juries, uh, the juries decide that a testator who left all the money to one son and cut out his two daughters is being unfair. He's showing some kind of sexist prejudice toward the children. And so they will correct what they deem to be unfair and redistribute the money so that all three get it. And uh, I guess that's a runaway jury. They may have made a fair outcome, but it may not have been what was in the old man's mind. And he had his reasons for doing what he did. Uh, maybe... Uh, his daughters all married rich guys and didn't need his money and his son is struggling or whatever. Uh, so it may be unnatural, uh, it may be unfair, it may be both, it may be neither. So we have to be careful uh, that we, we don't try and second guess somebody. We all have the right to be unfair. If on the other hand what the individual has done is an unnatural consequence of undue influence, then I think a revision is called for. Similar to number seven is number eight, where the will is now larded with provisions that seem at war with the testator's long-held beliefs and wishes. Um, you know, why would a lifelong conservative Republican all of a sudden leave all his money to the Americans for Democratic Action or the, the ACLU? Um, or why would a lifelong liberal decide to, to leave all of his money to uh, the McCain campaign you know, for president? So again, that would suggest that there's something uh, adverse afoot, and further scrutiny certainly would be required. Number nine is when the beneficiary has an exceptional opportunity to exercise undue influence. Propinquity, and I've Repeated will use the example of the new caretaker or the new housekeeper or the new best friend. Uh, there every day, uh, 
probably doesn't have to do a great deal to gradually gain the trust of the testator and begin to exercise undue influence. And finally, the last and most flagrant is when the beneficiary is active in procuring the execution of the will. Um, choosing an attorney, driving the guy down there, and God forbid, sitting in the office, uh, making suggestions. Um, this is a, perhaps, from a legal perspective, the most important thing, because it may alter the burden of proof. Uh, ordinarily, a will contestant has a burden of proof of undue influence. But the presumption shifts if the one beneficiary benefits substantially from the new document. Two, the beneficiary had a fiduciary or special confidential relationship with the decedent. And three, at least in California, and I think in other jurisdictions as well, if the beneficiary is a formally designated caregiver. Uh, very often I find that somebody that is obviously a caregiver and a housekeeper portrays herself as just, I'm just his friend. And they're doing that in order to avoid having the burden of proof uh, shift uh, to them. So the old man dies, and when the will is contested, the BTB comes forward with affidavits from the attorney, and maybe even from the old man's treating physician, saying that he was perfectly competent, not susceptible to undue influence. Gosh, he always seemed pretty sharp to me. Uh, this is not surprising. Uh, what attorney is going to affirm that he helped prepare a will for a manifestly insane individual? And the physician doubtless signed that affidavit in good faith because as far as he knew, which wasn't much, the testator was competent. Because after all, the doctor, like most internists, is a busy guy and he's going to be focusing on this guy skyrocketing blood glucose because he's not taking his insulin and his skyrocketing blood pressure and his decubitus ulcers and all the things that you've got to cover in the 20 minutes that the HMO has allowed us providers these days. By the way, when somebody calls me a provider, I hang up. I'm not a provider. I didn't go to medical school, spent all these years to be a provider. I'm a doctor, so please. I'm a physician. I don't know what a provider is. My mother was a provider. I'm a doctor. Uh, that aside, notwithstanding, one can take a deposition of the attorney and the practicing, the, the treating physician in such a way as to turn them uh, to witnesses for those who would contest the will. And I would suggest a line of questioning for the attorney along uh, these lines. Uh, Mr. Smith, you helped uh, to draft the new will of the decedent, um, my client's father? Yes. Uh, may I ask, how long did you know the decedent? Well, I didn't know him at all. I actually met with him twice. Once uh, before we drafted the will and he told me the, the changes he wanted to make and then three weeks later when he came to sign the will. But when he came to sign the will, what did you do to ascertain that he was competent and not susceptible to undue influence. Well, I asked him a bunch of questions. I see. Now, this bunch of questions, is this a, a protocol that you follow routinely in situations like this, or is it sort of an ad hoc affair where you sort of play it by ear? Uh, well, um, a little of both. All right, well, let's, let's, let's go over those questions. What questions do you want? Well, I asked him if he knew who he was, and it's good. And did he know the date, who the president was? Uh-huh. And did he understand what a will was? And what, then what else did you ask him? Well, I asked him if he knew we were going to change his will, and he said yes. And I asked him if he knew who the beneficiaries were in his old will, and he said yes. He knew who his kids were. And then I asked him if he knew who the, the is not the beneficiary of the new will, not your children, but Mrs. Jones, and he said yes, he understood that. And I asked him if he knew that he had a nice house on such and such street and that he had a lot of Procter & Gamble stock. 
and that, that this was all now going to go to Ms. Jones, and he said, yes, he knew that. I said, okay. Well, how do you know that he knew that? Well, I, I, he said, yes, he did, and there was nothing about his, his manner or his, his mental condition that would lead me to believe that he, he could not be taken at his word. Well, what tests of his cognitive abilities did you perform? Uh, did you check, for example, his memory? Did you give him any tests of memory? Um, did you talk to him about uh, his relationship with the children and why he no longer wanted to include them in the will? No, I didn't do any of those things. Um, did you ask him to tell you exactly how much his house is worth in this current real estate market? Uh, no, I didn't ask that. You did ask him that if he had Procter & Gamble stock, yes. Um, did you ask him how much? How much this was worth? Did you ask him the last time he checked uh, his stockbroker's accounts to see whether he was giving away $20,000 or $2 million? Well, uh, no, I didn't do that. Well, do you have a list of questions that you did ask him? No, I don't have any list of questions. Okay. All right. Well, um, how long have you known Miss Jones? Uh, well, I've known her for about five years. Have you done some work for her in the past? Uh, yes. Would it be fair to say that you are her attorney? Well, I have been her attorney, but in this case, I was uh, the, test uh, the decedent's attorney. And why is that? Well, he contacted me. Oh, he did. And how did that come about? Well, he contacted me on the phone. Where do you think he got your number? Oh, well, I, I, I don't know. Uh, did he look it up in the phone book? Well, I, I, I don't know. Do you know that he has about uh, 2,400 vision and he probably couldn't look things up in the phone book? No, I didn't know that. Counsel, when you then prepared the will, what did you do to ascertain that he understood what the terms of this new will were. Well, I did what I always do. I read him each paragraph, one by one. And at the end of each paragraph, I asked if he understood it. And he said, and he said yes. Well, after you did that, did you ask him to repeat back to you what he thinks he understood, in his own words, to ascertain that he really grasped the legal language, rather than simply nodding and said, saying, yes, I understand. And no, I didn't do that. So he didn't ask him to tell you back what he had just heard. I, I, no, I didn't do any of those things. Doctor, I'm sorry, uh, counselor, do you, um, do you know what a psychiatric examination is? Oh, yeah, sure I do. Have any of your clients ever had a psychiatric examination? Well, yeah, a couple. Any idea how long a psych exam takes? Well, well, I don't know, several hours. Why do you think it takes so long? Well, I guess because they got to ask them a lot of questions. Right. And aren't these questions designed to ascertain the mental state of the person being examined? Yes. So you will allow that at least sometimes this can take several hours. Yes. Are you aware that as people develop First of all, do you know what dementia is? Um, well, you know, I think so. Um, my grandmother, they said that uh, she, she had Alzheimer's, she had dementia. All right. Do you know what goes first when somebody develops dementia? And what is the last thing to go? Uh, um, no, I don't really know that. Well, I'm going to represent to you. Objection, thank you, noted. I'm going to represent to you that the first thing to go is memory and judgment, and the last thing to go is one social bearing, one social demeanor. That you can meet someone on the street and they've lost nine tenths of their cognitive ability, and you say, hi Sam, and they'll say, hi Jack, right back. Nothing that would suggest from their demeanor, they're not drooling on their shirt, that in point of fact they have advanced Alzheimer's. Remember those pictures of Ronald Reagan toward the end and waving to people on the way to the office. Um, so, is it possible, I guess this is a, forgive the long wittedness of this question, uh, counsel, but is it possible that the test data could have been socially intact and, and that was a shell? And within that cognitive shell, everything had been hollowed out by his various diseases. Is that a possibility? You know, I suppose anything's possible. Well, did you check it out to ascertain whether it was probable? 
What did you do to check out that his social bearing bore no relationship to his true cognitive ability to grasp what was taking place in that office? What did you do to ascertain whether or not the beneficiary had a great deal to do with his decision to change his will? So I think by, you get my drift. By the time this deposition is completed, I think you're, you're going to turn this uh, witness, or at least neutralize him pretty effectively. Um, but then he's a lawyer, so no one's going to believe him anyway. More problematic is the treating physician. And uh, there are some jurisdictions where I'm happy to say doctors are still well regarded. And so with somewhat more delicacy, you have to take the doctor on. And you don't want to make the doctor feel uh, there's a malpractice suit brewing, but get him to simply acknowledge that during the ordinary course of practicing good medicine, you have to pick and choose the things that, that you focus upon. Uh, doctor, you've been practicing medicine how many years? Mm -hmm. And your specialty is uh -huh, internal medicine. So you don't practice psychiatry. Well, we did take some psychiatry courses in, in medical school. Uh, how many years ago was that? So you don't do much psychiatry now, all right? When was the last time you saw the deceit? Uh, it was about two weeks before his death, I see. And um, did you see him on a regular basis a year ago? Uh, yes, and are you aware that it was about a year ago that he changed his will and left everything to his new housekeeper? His his new 21-year-old housekeeper. And, um, and that didn't make you suspicious. Uh, the doctor has a sense of humor. He'll tell that, that, that joke about the uh, time that an elderly gentleman came for a premarital physical examination. He was going to marry a 21-year-old woman. He was, he was 89. And so the doctor was concerned. He said, well, you know, you look pretty good, but gosh, you're 89. She's 21. And marrying a woman like that, you know, in the bedroom, and, uh, you know, it can kill you. You know, something like that can be fatal. It's a 60 year age difference between the two of you. The old man says, Well, look, if she dies, she dies. Yeah. No, I didn't really look into that, the doctor will say on deposition. Um, so you don't really know too much about the relationship between. Miss Jones and the test editor. You know, she, she, all you know is that she, she drove him to see you uh, uh, twice a month. That's right. And when you would see him, what would be your focus? Well, he's got a lot of medical problems. Well, tell us about those. Well, he's got, he had uh, heart failure. He was on digitalis. He had diabetes. He had hypertension. Um, he had these terrible decubitus ulcers. He had a lot of arthritis. Uh, he had a lot of uh, problems, and ultimately he died from multiple systems failure. Well, it sounds, Doc, like you had pretty much had your hands full with this man. Did you do any neurological assessment of him? Uh, no, he didn't seem to have any neurological impairment. Well, how about a mental status exam? You remember that from medical school, where you check to see whether or not he perceives the same things everybody else does? Did you check his mentation, to check his his executive function, his cognition, his judgment. Um, did he know what was going on around him? What about his memory, both immediate and remote? Did you check any of those things? Well, no, he always seemed pretty sharp to me. Uh -huh. Well, how about his emotional state? Uh, do you know, for example, how dependent he may have been on uh, Miss Jones? Uh, do you know if he engaged in any unusual behavior, with or without Miss Jones? No, I, I didn't check any of those things. Now, that's not unusual, is it, Doctor? I mean, you're an internist. Um, you don't do psychiatric work, no. If you have a psychiatric case, or one of your patients develops some psychiatric symptoms, what do you do? Well, I send them to a psychiatrist that I, I respect. And when you send them to a psychiatrist, what does a psychiatrist do? Well, there's a psychiatric workup. Would that psychiatric workup be useful in determining an individual's mental competence? and susceptibility to undue influence. I suppose it would. How long do you think that would take? Well, about several hours. And do you think it would also involve some testing, some psychological tests? Yes. 
Uh, did you do any of those tests? No. And you say you didn't do a comprehensive psychiatric workup, because that's not what interns do, right? That's correct. So would it be fair to say, doctor, that though you were pretty well up on every aspect of this man's physical condition, you really don't know what his mental state was at the time he changed his will. Would that be a fair statement? Yes. And it would be fair to say that his physical condition alone, with his impending systems failure you talked about, could that in and by itself, if not render him incompetent, then at least make him uncommonly dependent upon Ms. Jones. Yes, perhaps uniquely susceptible to her influence. Yes, I suppose that's so. Thank you. No further questions, doctor. So there I think you have it. Um, an attorney may himself or herself be unaware of these issues before a will is changed uh, and may be unable to gather all these little bits and pieces, the subtle nuances, the circumstances that lead an individual to make a testamentary decision. Without doubt, if you have any suspicions that incompetence or undue influence can be at play, you can protect yourself very simply by having a, a psychiatric or psychological assessment on the day that the will is changed and save yourself all this grief and perhaps uh, protect your new client uh, from doing something that five or six years earlier when they had all their marbles, they never would have done. Thank you very much. A uh, question, doctor. Um, because in many of these circumstances, the person is already deceased, it's a little late to go back and do a, an exam. Um, where the beneficiary to be is a family member, where there's some idea that this person might at some point come into the will, or might have been in the will as a, as a partial beneficiary, and now the other beneficiaries are kicked out. Um, is it just the, the physical arrangements that surrounded the person that are most important, or how, how would we go back to that, assuming we can't prove one way or another whether the person was really mentally competent or not? The question is, since by definition the decedent is no longer susceptible to a psychiatric examination, how can you retrospectively ascertain that they was under influence at the time the will was signed. And first and foremost, you've got to get the past medical records. And the past medical records will be loaded with clues. For example, I'll give you sort of an obvious one, but even if the, the, the internist Spartan notes, a line or two here and there, make no reference to his mental condition, but you see that the doctor prescribed him Valium or one of the antipsychotic medications or antidepressant. That's a presumption that there was something going on with this individual mentally and emotionally that would have rendered them theoretically susceptible. Um, you need to take the, the, a searching deposition, if you can find them, of people who knew the deponent, the, the, the decedent, shortly before his death, people who were relatively disinterested, but who had enough opportunity to know how he changed over the last five or six years. As I'm saying, simply waving hello to him in the street isn't good enough. But let's say that he used to um, regularly go to have his hair cut. I'll bet you the barber would say, you know, he hardly comes around anymore. And he used to be quite chatty, and we would joke about things, and we could talk about uh, how the Knicks did, and... and uh, how the Dodgers were doing. The last year or two, he didn't even seem to know who the Dodgers were. And we had no conversation at all. He and I, you know, we went to the same high school together, so we had a lot in common, but he was like this empty shell. Just a lay guy, but wow, what powerful testimony by which you can reconstruct the state of mind of the deceased. 